Thanks to Amanda Thomas for bringing folks together in our community and bringing that music forward into this space. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Fall Drum Caucus. It's really great to have each and every one of you here. My name is Joseph Santos Lyons, and I have the privilege of serving as the community minister with Drum. And we're excited to have this program with um, and among each of you here today. Um, and before we kind of get into the full program, we just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge um, that our world is in a painful and violent time. And in many ways, there are kind of many incidents and conflicts and war happening around the world in this particular moment of what's happening but in but, uh, um in the Gaza Strip and in Israel uh, has got has 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 brought a lot of attention. Um, and as Black Indigenous people of color, we pay attention, you know, often to conflict and the suffering in many other places also around the world that don't always get this kind of attention. So we're just holding that complexity, holding that humanity, holding our humanity, holding our complexity in this moment, and just want to make sure that we said that. And one of the things that I appreciate deeply about the drum space and community is solidarity between people and particularly between people of color is very challenging. And ultimately it is for me often about peace and about building a kind of a relationship in a community that can hold, um, that can hold disagreement, that can hold conflict in ways that are constructive and healthy and we all have an opportunity to thrive. So thank you again, each and every one of you for being here. We are going to open in a few moments with um, just some small group introductions and a chance for folks to meet a couple other folks in the community. Um, our vision for the caucus uh, this, this fall is to have a bit more of an open space, kind of a less scripted, kind of a more um, opportunity for folks to engage around the questions and the themes of family and spiritual growth and faith formation. Um, and I know each and every us, each and every one of us comes from a family and each of our families, like each of us, is unique um, and diverse and different. And as Unitarian Universalists, we, I think, have an opportunity um, and often a need as people of color to really think about um, kind of questions that don't get attention in our congregations, you know, attention, you know, um, um, sort of issues around culture, around language, around 
um, kind of intergenerational family um, uh, and many, many more. Uh, and so we're really um, both trying to respond to what we hear from members that these are often issues and challenges that come up in pastoral care, that come up in the desire for the kind of Unitarian Universalist community that we seek, that we want to be a part of. And we're going to have an opportunity to hear today from four of our uh, member leaders, which is really wonderful. Um, but we also have a chance to hear from you in different ways. And so I'm going to welcome our, um, our panelists and we're going to bring them up to share their introductions one by one. And um, we're going to be inviting them to share a bit about who they are and their initial reflections on our theme, uh, which is around family. And what we've heard from our members over the past couple of years is that we're often navigating the complexities of our multi-religious and multicultural family dynamics um, and doing that as a Unitarian Universalist. And that drum members we hear often really strive for authenticity and seeking some grounding in their faith journey. And as we shared in the opening, often not having this space um, to ask and engage in these questions in our traditional congregations. And so we're hoping to create some of that space here within drum. And we'll be giving, we'll be asking our panel and then each of you to reflect on both the opportunities and the challenges of faith formation and spiritual growth in your family and how we engage with our generations, our extended family, our blended families. How do we make intentional decisions about the cultural and spiritual nourishment that our families need? So that's our broad theme for today's caucus. And with that, I'd like to go ahead and uh, welcome our first panelist up to give um, a hello and uh, some introductions. And I'm going to invite the Reverend Dr. Natalie Fenimore. Hello, everyone. I'm the Reverend Dr. Natalie Fenimore. I am currently um, lead minister and minister of lifespan religious education at the UU congregation at Shelter Rock on Long Island in New York. Uh, you may use she, her pronouns when you're talking to me or just my name to minimize any pronoun use at all. I've been um, a religious educator um, and ordained minister for a long time now, for 25 years. And um, I've um, observed that most UU congregations are challenged to see the full diversity of people of color, actually the full diversity of most people, and um, therefore challenged to serve those congregations around their full diversity and complexity, around all of their needs. There's a tendency to oversimplify and stereotype because um, that minimizing diversity and complexity of identity seems to make pe some people think then they can do things more easily, um, which is actually not the case, but that's where people start with trying to figure out how to do things easily and sim simply. So they uh, minimize and try to ignore complexity. As both a religious professional and a parent, I have experienced a failure to expand the role of our congregations um, to have them function more around identity formation, identity fortification, resilience building, um, being a space for families, children, youth, of color to find the resources that they need to stand apart from the negative messages in the outside world. So that is a traditional role that many um, people of color have found in their religious communities, which is not necessarily present uh, automatically in any Unitarian Universalist congregation. So I think, um, to acknowledge that this, these kind of resources don't exist is the first step to then making them exist. So our congregation should acknowledge that being that kind of space that provides that sort of 
identity formation, identity fortification, and resilience actually benefits everyone in the congregation. That while you may do it, thinking you're doing it for just this group, it actually helps everyone in the congregation. It helps Unitarian Universalism become its best self. BIPOC learnings are valuable for everyone. And so they should be presented with that value for everyone. So I think there needs to be more attention also to BIPOC elders and BIPOC eldering, a way of eldering that we find in our communities um, of color that in BIPOC communities, actually the oral tradition is very strong. And that way of learning and teaching and passing on is something that's not organic to Unitarian Universalism, which tends to be um, a more, a, a less of an oral tradition. And so we have to build spaces for that, I think, because that's the way that the multi-generational connection is made. It's absolutely necessary in oral tradition. If not, so much is lost. We, I think we all experience that with the, um, with the pandemic, where communities of color were losing elders at a disproportionate uh, number. And people were thinking for perhaps with the clarity they didn't have before, that those were libraries being lost. They were lives, they were, there was history, there was connection being lost there. So I think that's a learning we should take from that time that we need to hold that, those people and what they represent more close. Um, and we should not spend a lot as much time perhaps having the um, UU youth of color in separate space from elders and try to combine them more, which is more along the lines of what is traditionally done in BIPOC communities. So UU spaces should be places where there's both this continuity and connection. And that means I think that there needs to be intentional material, product, um, curriculum, workshops, training, support uh, for BIPOC UU uh, faith formation that might be best to use a small group model because we are small groups within individual congregations. And while being online is wonderful, in-person matters. Um, and there needs to be a continued support, more support for collegial groups for BIPOC religious professionals. And that includes supporting them in the congregation, putting in more support that will make success for BIPOC religious professionals more possible because they will serve BIPOC communities within their congregations. They can change Unitarian Universalism from the ground up and they model. It is important for UU children and youth of, to, of color to see leadership that looks like them and to see that leadership succeed and I believe we all know that there is a lack of success for BIPOC religious professionals. And when people can see that, that, um, that wounds our movement. And I think that, that those are the areas in which I would like us to, to consider better support for the children, youth and families around programming and uh, better support for the religious professionals and understanding the need for identity formation and fortification and resilience building in our communities in our, from our congregations up to the denominational level, associational level. Thanks. Thank you so much, Natalie. Now I'd like to welcome Asia Hauser, uh, part of the lead ministry team with the Church of the Larger Fellowship. And really glad to have you here, Asia. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I am Aisha Hauser. My pronouns are she and her. And thank you, Joseph, for the invitation to be part of this group. And Natalie, who is one of not only one of my favorite piece of people, one of my personal close friends. Um, you know, speaking after Natalie is always tough because I'm like, everything I want to say is, uh, A, I want to affirm everything uh, that you said, Natalie. I, I took a couple of notes because um, we do need to grapple with, you know, what it means to center community, 
through uh, BIPOC learnings, our learnings for everyone, to quote what you just said, we need a way of eldering. Uh, we also, I think one of the things that I've, I've served, uh, both Natalie and I have served many congregations, um, and it's fascinating to me how, how we want to think we're so different among different congregations, but there are, um, it, it seems endemic to Unitarian Universal spaces, kind of a sameness of the, the question of what to do with the children and youth or involving children and youth tends to be either transactional or we're going to, you know, have a, 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 um, I'm a, I want, what's the Christmas uh, program, the um, pageant, right? It's either a show or transactional. Let's have youth do something rather than what does it mean to be truly multi-generational, which I think when we uh, bring BIPOC community norms, which are multi-generational, I'm Egyptian, everything we did was multi-generational. And yes, we heard the adults curse and say inappropriate things all the time. Now, I'm not saying... <laughs> That's it's a it's good or bad, but it's also life, right? It's it's a framing of this is life happening, and um, I read Joy Harjo's uh, "What It Means to Be Human" poem all the time, uh, where we you know life happens around the kitchen table. It's a beautiful poem. I I um, re recommend looking it up if you don't know it. Um, and and we also I think we as a collective it behooves us to. Um, be courageous and bold and not be afraid to ask for what our needs are. And, and as Natalie said, I think supporting religious professionals of color that don't want to continue to replicate the same kinds of systems that haven't served uh, folks in the BIPOC community. And so this, uh, I, there was a family when I was in, still in a brick and mortar, a religious educator, here in the Northwest, I live in Seattle, um, land of the Coast Salish people. And we had a family come in from Bolivia. And, and he, um, one of the things the dad said to me is, you know, he said, my first time here, you tried to take my children away. <laughs> because what happened is when they got here, the well, we had a welcome table, which is what we say to have, Every, you know, the folks said, you know, here's our sanctuary, and there's RE two buildings away. There's a, we're in the Northwest, so the church has a campus, and when he put it that way, I said, it was alarming to hear it quite in that perspective. Like, why can't my children sit with me in the sanctuary? He said, you tried to take my children away. So let's not take children away. Let us actually have places where we want to um, learn what it means to be human together. And there are times where maybe children don't wanna be there. We do make space for children to, um, be together and ask questions and grapple with what it means to, you know, understand the world that right now is a very, very, when it has it not been a scary place right now, the scariness of the world is much more present for more people. Um, the issue, this, the, what's happening in Palestine right now, I grew up with, I'm Egyptian. I, I would, that was never not part of what we talked about in our home. And yet now the world is understanding much more because it's being filmed. Right. Um, so I, personally, I grew up in a, um, well, I grew up Muslim. My ex-husband is Jewish. So we intentionally chose Unitarian Universalism because I didn't want my children, I would have taken them to a temple or a synagogue, but I didn't want them to hear anti-Arab sentiment. I didn't want to take them to a mosque because I didn't want them to hear anti-Semitic sentiment. And so I chose intentionally a place um, where they can be affirmed in the fullness of who they are not that there weren't issues once my son especially entered youth, uh, the youth programs, uh, and neither of my children who are now young adults identifies Unitarian Universalists. However, they do operate in the world, and I, I see it recognizing them, the values and their critical thinking that they very much internalized from having a religious educator mom and bringing them to Sunday school uh, with me every week. So I will leave it there. Thank you all so much for this space. So thank you, Aisha. Um, and I'm going to welcome an uh, old friend and longtime former drum leader from like the early days, James Coombs from Los Angeles, from the Neighborhood Church. Thanks for 
joining us and uh, also for your service uh, for all these years. And I know that you've taken on the role of congregational president this year of a large congregation at Pasadena Neighborhood Church. Uh, so we're really glad to have you take, uh, please Thank welcome. You, Joseph. Thank you. Um, again, James Coombs, um, pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I live in the Los Angeles area. I live in Burbank, California, and I go to church as Joseph said in Pasadena, which is the ancestral and unceded territories of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. Um, I am six foot four. I identify as black. I am generally missing my hair. Uh, this is important because it's part of how I live and work and 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 navigate the world. I'm a social worker, and um, I've been working in social work now for gosh, close to 28 years, a little bit longer than that. And um, we use it. We use a concept um, or a, a theoretical perspective of the person in the environment. So we're looking at individuals, and we're also looking at the environments in which they function. And that's important because as I've gotten older, I f I find myself reflecting back on my 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 formation experiences in growing up. Um, I am transracially adopted. Um, as I mentioned, I'm six foot four. I identify as black. My parents are five foot two and white. And one of the things that um, I recall early on learning is that trans, because transracial adoptees know they're transracial adoptees, the issues of adoption kind of hit us a little bit differently because we know we're adopted from the word go. Um, and that also puts us in an environment where we're aware, there's a certain awareness that we're not necessarily like everybody else in our environment, especially in Unitarian Universalist settings. Um, I grew up in a church in uh, a suburb of Chicago and it was, uh, I, I was adopted at three months of age, so I pretty much identify as a lifelong Unitarian Universalist. Grew up in RE, was actively involved in, in RE programs as a kid all the way through high school. And um, one of a very few people of color. It was when, um, it was actually my first general assembly that I went to in 1998 that it really, it really struck me hard because I walked into a space in Rochester, New York, and this is where I met Joseph and, and, and others here. And, um, seeing that many people of color in a space together, the first reaction is it feels like something, something's very wrong. Why would there be this many people of color gathered in one space and one time in a Unitarian Universalist setting? And so this, this, is, this community is part of what I've lived into with my identity as well. So I grew up as a UU. Um, when I uh, went off to college, uh, age of 17, a year later, I met the person that would become my spouse. She's Catholic. And um, I, I share playfully when I was first, uh, when we were first dating, um, she told me that her father was a grand knight. And I was a little panicked um, because I was confusing grand knight and grand dragon from each other. And so I was when I met him the first time, he is um, a Hispanic male, and I was really struggling with trying to figure out how does a Hispanic male become a Grand Knight. It took me a little bit while longer to understand that. Uh, for those of you that are familiar, my 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 spouse is Catholic, and her family is Catholic, um, and and very steeped in Catholic tradition. And so, just until recently, my spouse actually just joined the Unitarian Universalist Church, so she identifies as a Catholic UU now. We have two kids. Um, they are 22 and 19. They grew up in Unitarian Universalist spaces at, at Neighborhood Church in Pasadena. And um, they, because of my involvement in the church, it always felt like a, a home space for them. Um, we have a very active, vibrant uh, people of color group at Neighborhood Church. And it has been um, critically important in, in their spiritual identity because growing up as a kid, feeling a little little outside sometimes, they grew up in a space where it's like, where, where they experienced a little bit more diversity than I did as a kid. And that was extremely helpful. Our kids, by the way, and we'll come back to this in a little bit, but our kids, by the way, were also raised as both Catholic and UU. Lots of stories about that. I actually did get married in the Catholic Church. Uh, the priest uh, did not need me to convert because I was trying to explain to him that a dedication ceremony is the moral equivalent of a baptism. Um, he didn't buy it, but he didn't make me convert. Uh, and so we've grown up, our kids have grown up in spaces where they've been uh, very steeped in Catholic tradition, steeped in Unitarian Universalist tradition. And that is actually the same way I was transracially adopted, navigating a, a diverse environment that didn't necessarily match my personal identity. Um, my kids grew up in that as well. And but they were also in a space because of our people of color group that really made it feel like family for them. So they felt safe. They were able to explore this. I'm, I'm grateful for creating that opportunity. But it was by the grace of God and sheer luck that we did that because it, reflecting back on it is very different. 
than than putting one foot in front of the other, hoping that you're doing the right thing. I'm going to stop there uh, because of time, and I want to make sure that we're continuing with the panel. So looking forward to the, continuing the discussion. Thank you, James. And our uh, closing panelist uh, for introductions and initial re uh, kind of initial reactions is the Reverend Elizabeth Wynn, who I just wanted to just give kind of a shout out to all the ministry you've done with youth and young adults of color in particular. And that's how I first kind of got the chance to connect with you. And um, also, I uh, hope we get to get a get a little bit of Elena time um, on the Zoom. So welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Joseph. Could folks just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? I'm in great. Thank you. Well, I feel like I should channel that shout out around ministry to youth and young adults of color to so many people on this call, but you know, particularly you, Reverend Dr. Natalie, and you, Asia, and all of the religious educators who have been doing that work for so long. Um, I'm Reverend Elizabeth Wynn. I'm a Unitarian Universalist community minister. I live in Malden, Massachusetts, on Massachusetts land. And I do social justice work right now, particularly around immigration as my full-time justice ministry. Um, but like Joseph said, um, not only do I have a strong commitment just as a Unitarian Universalist to youth and young adults of color, I was one of those youth and young adults of color growing up Unitarian Universalist, um, like I think, you know, James shared about and probably many others on the call. Um, I'm Vietnamese on my dad's side and Irish, German, European from folks who um, were settlers in Western New York on Seneca Nation land on my mom's side. And as Joseph mentioned, I am a pretty new parent to my daughter, Elena, who is Vietnamese and Irish, German and Bolivian. Um, and I think a lot of how I'm coming to this conversation is actually as a new parent of a multiracial uh, seventh month old Unitarian Universalist and thinking a lot about um, how I want her to be so fully herself. And I want her to have access to all of the Unitarian Universalist practice and practices and traditions and songs and um, summer camp experiences and that I, felt grateful to grow up in. Um, and I also am one of those people whose parents came to Unitarian Universalism because they wanted a space where my dad's Buddhist heritage and my mom's Catholic heritage, though she's not identifying as Catholic now, but still that heritage could both be honored. And I think that that's really true of how I think about Elena and think about her growing up um, at the UU congregation in Malden, where I currently attend. Um, some of the other reflections that I have are about how important it's been for me to realize that I will not get robust spiritual community as a Vietnamese American in Unitarian Universalist spaces, and that's okay. And that for me, being connected to the Vietnamese community here in Boston, being connected to other young adults who are Vietnamese American and doing social justice work are places that I can get that spiritual need met. And I think it will be the same for Elena. She will not find robust Bolivian community, um, except maybe with, with Aisha's uh, congregants um, at most few churches. But I think that she can find a spiritual home within Unitarian Universalism and have some of her needs for cultural and racial belonging in her family and in her wider community. I want her to feel fully Vietnamese and fully Bolivian and fully Unitarian Universalist. And if my experience is any indication, I don't think she will. And I think that's okay she will figure out how those different aspects of her identity shine and in what ways and what belonging means um, and what thriving means for those different aspects of herself over time. Um, and, you know, I do, I think a lot about like this question of um, what if she doesn't want to be you? What if she doesn't resonate with the community that I really love? 
And I think that's actually where a lot of my faith formation is right now, personally, as a parent, is recognizing the autonomy of this whole other human who will have her home, her whole path, own path and exploration. But one of the commitments I do want to make to her is that the cultural practices we have at home, um, celebrating Lunar New Year, Tet, having an altar. Um, it's important for us that we speak Spanish in the home. It's important for us that we celebrate All Souls Day in the home, that those are practices we will share in our UU community if it nourishes us, but we will not become objects for our fellow Unitarian Universalists and we will not have those practices be extracted from us if it's not part of how we authentically show up in spiritual community. So I think I'll pause there and turn it back to you, Joseph, but really grateful to be here. Thank you, Elizabeth. We're going to um, invite each of the kind of guest panelists to do another final round of sharing. And we're going to bring them all up on the screen now for you to see. And this is really kind of a chance to kind of offer additional thoughts, particularly around faith formation and spiritual growth in our families and to react to one another. Well, then we'll have about 20 minutes for some Q&A with the full caucus before we go to a break and then some small groups. So I wanted to invite um, Reverend Dr. Natalie back up to um, kind of offer kind of any, any continuing thoughts that you have. Well, I was listening to um, both Elizabeth and Aisha, this idea about how we also need to provide other resources, other connections. I think that that's an area that um, religious professionals, and to a certain extent, you know, we have to recognize, for better or worse, religious professionals of color get asked to be the people to build the bridge, right? Um, so. And, and that can be appropriate, but sometimes it's a burden. I think we should enable more of our pro religious professionals of all races, cultures, and classes to know enough about what other things there are that people might need. Not to feel you have to do it all or be it all in your, in your community or congregation, but to be more open to saying that there are these other things in other places that perhaps your family or um, any family might want to know about. Um, and I know that that's a fine line, as Elizabeth was saying, um, also not making it a show, right? Not making it like, okay, I see that we need to, well, let's invite some dance troupe or some special speaker or something to come in because you're telling me that I need to be more multi whatever. So it's a line. I recognize that it's there, that it's fuzzy sometimes, but the idea that, um, just to be clear, that, that we can't be everything for everybody in your congregation, perhaps it's not appropriate, perhaps it's not the space, but did you do you know enough to support and walk the journey with a family that's trying to expand what Unitarian Universalism is for them? Because that, I think, is one of the reasons that we get um, youth who don't want to continue, because they have been given such a narrow idea about what being a Unitarian Universalist is. And if they don't fit that, um, they haven't been given sort of a range. Um, and we're denying that ourselves, as, as a Unitarian Universalist community, the ability to expand our everybody's idea you know, about what, what this association could be, should be, might want to be. Um, so in, in hearing you, you know, thinking about what my own kids growing up, um, sort of the, the struggle to try to find other things to put into the bucket, <laughs> you know, and to, to be in relationship uh, with different communities, with their own culture, their own background. So I was thinking about that when you were talking. Thanks, Natalie. And we can popcorn here if needed, but if not, I would invite Aisha. Thanks, Joseph. Um, one of the things that's been coming up for me uh, as uh, I was not born here, I'm an immigrant, and 
my mom, bless her, tried to raise me as an Egyptian strict Muslim in a town where we were probably, it's not an exaggeration to say, probably for many years were the only Egyptian Muslims. Now there were other Arabs, but maybe less than 10 um, in this town right outside Newark, New Jersey. So so we what Unitarian Universalism, I for me, I'm now gonna go a little meta, is it as the great is the same it replicates the same experiment that the United States is. So we're trying to be a pluralist faith, which is not how humanity has been for eons, for the most part. Like, yes, people have, you know, there's been eras of human history where religions coexisted, but I but we're trying to be one religion and say, um, you know, we we people find us for many different reasons. We're an interfaith family. Many are interfaith families. And so how do we truly, for me, this is what I ask myself, how do we truly be plural, pluralist? Because my, my daughter at nine, my kids met their grandmother. I'm very happy to say Natalie also met my mom, um, who is still very strict Muslim. And my, my daughter at nine said to me, Grandma Safa thinks if you're not Muslim, you're going to go to hell. So which religion is right? And her other grandmother is Jewish, like from generations, right? And and I, at that, you know, we're driving because everything spiritual happens when you're driving with uh, your children or with young people. And I, I had to kind of think quickly because I hadn't thought about it, like being asked which one is right, because, the, you know, for me, the answer is no one is right. No, none of us know what we're doing. Um, my daughter calls Unitarian Universalism a made up religion. I said, we're all made up. At least we know we're making it up as we going along. But at nine, what I said to her is, Religions are like languages. You speak French, Arabic, Spanish, um, English, and it's how people communicate to, with what they believe God is, their God. And it was an incomplete and yet the best I can do. And I think for me, that's been the challenge as a faith leader, religious educator, and as a parent. How do we both affirm the human dignity of every person when there are some people that have some pretty challenging, harmful ideas. So I want to, for a second, put aside, you know, fascist murdering governments. Like I I'm now talking like in our congregations, when people say and do insensitive things, how do we center grace? How do we still have boundaries? And maybe this is a bigger discussion and a rabbit hole we don't want to go down, but I do think it's all connected and it's all related. Um, you know, I've tried to say to my children, affirming people fully in who they are is, is simply not easy and it's what we're called to do. And I think Unitarian Universalism can be those spaces if we can do better at centering those who um, are not in the numerical majority. We are the global majority people of color, but in our UU spaces, we are not the majority. However, I think our experiences can nurture and inform you spaces when we can center who we are and how we are. Thank you, Aisha. James. Yeah, I, I'm I'm really appreciating this. But it, just as a side note, um, the opportunity to engage in discussions like this is is part of how I practice my faith. Um, it is it is it is core and central to to being able to share spaces like this to 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 influence me. I'm really appreciating Reverend Natalie what you said around identity fortification, um, and I'm contrasting that with what Asia said about it being a pageant. Um, it it really is in both. And and shout out to Asia by the way for being a social worker because that that's a part of um, um, I think what has helped and influenced me, Elizabeth, Reverend Elizabeth said something, uh, was talking about having a robust spiritual community for her and her family and how, how to get that. Um, my thoughts are all over the place, but I, my kids had an elementary school principal who uh, would often get the question from uh, parents about what, what readings should they have their kids be doing? What things should they expose their kids to during the summer so they could have an academic um, advantage when they came back in the fall? And the principal responded every time saying, I want your kids to go out and splash in the mud. I want your kids to go out and have experiences because that is gonna, what, that's what's going to make the experience in the classroom and the educational experience more robust. I think that's what we do in Unitarian Universalism as well. We need to have experiences outside of the church that we can then bring in and share. So there's there's this element of um, we, we can help with our faith form. We, we can help gain faith formation in our Unitarian Universalist spaces and churches 
but we also need to bring in outside experiences and almost like a show and tell, which sometimes is kind of like a pageant a little bit. Um, just, just critically important that we, that we, that we don't limit our spiritual identity to what's happening on campus at our churches and that we, that we need to bring our, our full selves into it. And, and sometimes it's hard to feel safe to do that. I'm thinking um, real briefly, I'm thinking about one of the experiences I had as a kid. Um, I had an opportunity to live in Saudi Arabia for a couple of years in middle school. And recently my, my parents had the idea that they are, all, they had a whole box of slides that were all old and beat up and everything. And they were about to throw them out and I rescued them. And what I did was I just finished scanning about 4,000 slides from travels around international travels around the world and seeing where leaving the United States, all of a sudden I became and saw that I was the global minority, global majority. And my parents saw that they were the global minority. We never got a chance to really talk about that much, but it absolutely influenced what I brought back into my safe spiritual places, including spaces like drum. So it's it's critically important that we that we bring that outside world into the work that we're doing and that we don't leave our faith at the door of our churches and that we try to live into that and bring that back and share that with each other. Thank you, James. Elizabeth. Yeah, you know, um, I was sitting here reflecting in, in the small groups that we had about how I found it very painful as a young person to be multiracial. Um, oh, and I see that, I wonder if folks can hear me. Can folks hear me? I just wanna, sure, okay. Um, thanks, James. Um, how, how being multiracial was often a source of pain because I felt like I didn't have other people to share in that experience. And I was not alone as a person of color growing up UU. I was very lucky to actually grow up um, in the same congregation as Alandria Williams um, and to be in a youth group led by Alandria. Um, and I still often was angry at my parents because I felt like they couldn't support me as a multiracial person because they were not multiracial. And now I feel so honored and grateful to be able to be part of young people who are multiracial lives and particularly to be brought into people's families and to be in connection with young people who that's part of our shared experience is navigating multiple places of belonging, navigating uh, multiple cultures, navigating our unique identities. Um, so I'm just thinking about uh, how different experiences that can be a source of pain and challenge over the course of my life have also then become really sacred experiences and places where I can offer a connection to others. The other thing I'm thinking about is our very, very small people of color group at the church I attend and how exactly as folks have been sharing on this call at our last um, go round where people said just like, what are you hoping from, from this group? What people said was, like a text thread where people could say, hey, I'm going to the Juneteenth family picnic. Is anyone else going to be there? Hey, I'm going to the Lunar New Year, Lunar, New, Lunar New Year mooncakes thing at the library. Is anyone else going to be there? And I think, you know, there's a lot to say about the complexity of, um, you know, secular cultural events and, and the aspects of sort of performance and the, potential consumptive nature, or appropriative nature, it's its very complicated. And at the end of the day, like that is what one of the things I want for my church right now is like a text thread of people who are navigating multiple belonging and who we can be in our UU church together. We can be in our community spaces together with our families, with the fullness of our identities. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you all. So I wanted to share just some of the highlights from some of the comments I'm seeing, and then I'm going to read out the questions that have been dropped in the chat so far. And if you have other questions, um, please go ahead and add them to the chat. That'll probably be the easiest. Um, I want to just, um, just going back through the comments earlier, uh, as folks were sharing on the panel, uh, Menica found resonance in the concept of multi-generational living and its significance in various cultures. Uh, Leilani um, has transformed their home congregation to create intergenerational spaces, bringing families and youth together. 
Jan expressed some concern. This is a personal comment about how her vocal complaints about what she feels like is lacking in Unitarian Universalism may have influenced her daughter's decision to leave the faith. Paula is reflecting on the issues of extraction and appropriation with the new congregations with limited BIPOC representation. Rachel has been contemplating accountability within her church, aiming to make it an opportunity for growth in the faith rather than a burden. And Linda emphasized the shared the significance of demonstrating how you you congregations do live their values and discussing what that embodiment looks like in practice. And some of the questions that have come up, and I'm just going to go ahead and just read them out and whoever on the panel would like to really jump in and tackle one or more and we'll put them into the chat as well so folks can see them. Um, Sue asks, how are you using oral traditions in your church or how can we? Um, Felicia asks, how do you respond when the outside uh, resources you find are more uplifting and affirming than the progress that is being made or not made in your congregation? Um, Rachel, uh, I, I shared her comment. Um, and uh, so I think, oh, and then uh, uh, Cece asks, does it matter that parents drop their children off? for our RE and don't join. So those are maybe three main questions that have come up so far um, from folks uh, in the caucus. I would love to answer the parent one first because it is, was such a pet peeve of mine when, so here's the thing. Okay, I'm gonna try to keep this super brief. Um, that is so, you know, capitalist, to me, the and it's transactional. Like, and parents, a lot of parents did it for our whole lives. The sexuality education program, drop and go, um, and then the minister would complain to me that they weren't staying for the sermon or the worship. So, you know, my thing is, and I would say this to parents, um, and we say this when we're um, introducing our whole lives. You are your your child's primary educator, whether it comes to sexuality or religion or really everything, because whether what you're saying or not saying to them and around them will impact how they view the world, whether you want it to or not. And so um, what you, what parents do is model. And so when I actually decided, I didn't decide before I even we settled on going to a UU church. My kids were five and two. And I said to my to their father, I'm not gonna raise them Unitarian Universalist if this is not something you're on board with. So we all went, the first year we went to the Unitarian congregation in Ridgewood, New Jersey. And he said, all religions are stupid, but this is, you know, fine. This is good, fine because they're not talking about hell or, you know, but, but it, I wasn't going to do it um, if he wasn't on board. And so for me, it's very important to um, ask the question, why are parents doing that? And what are the ways? And, and we can't be everything for everyone either, but I do think there's a loss in that. And, and I'd love to hear my panel, you know, fellow panelists, if you all, what you all think, because I'm not saying I'm right. That just, for me, it feels like there's value in, um, at the very least, being on the same page of what you want to uh, affirm for you know, the, the beings you are tasked with raising the love and care for. Yeah. You know, I want to say that this is a reflection of the way in which we're taught to work through most institutions. And I think it is a reflection of what is particularly dangerous for BIPOC people. Um, this is just like sending your kids to school and not paying attention to what they're teaching them. Right. If you're sin, if you, if you actually believe that you can walk into any institutional space, including a place of worship and be clear that you know what they're going to say to your children and how your children are going to be affected and you're clear so you're just going to walk away. So I think it's worth that conversation always with the parents that first of all you as parents have something to offer and so you should be offering it to your children to the children around your children to the other parents to the larger congregation. You are devaluing yourself if you are not present. And you're devaluing, in this case, your culture and your background and your experience if you are not offering it. 
You're allowing yourself to be a victim of the way you have been taught, which is that you should give over the care and feeding of your children to institutions who at their base do not have the care and feeding of your children as their top priority, right? Uh, all institutions in this country were formed in, um, in white supremacy. And that doesn't mean that they do, that they are intentional about that. It's the nature. So if you want to transform it to be a healthy and safe place for your child and your family, you have to take some effort to do that. And if you absent yourself, you have no idea what is actually happening. You imagine that you do, but you have no idea what is actually happening. So I think it's important to say that to parents, just as you would at, you know, to say to a parent at school, go in, sit in the room, hear what is being said. If you want to decide to step out after that, but you should be informed. I think it's, uh, that's what I think um, a religious educator needs to be able to be um, supported in, trained in, understand their role in getting the families involved and why, and how that's a benefit to all the children and to the entire community. Um, that it is a statement of the worth of those people that you're trying to make. I think you should say to them directly, I need you here because you add value to who we are as a community and without you, we are less. So when you drop over the door, you are diminishing this community. And I think, I think we all should say that at least once to people and let them make their choice. I, I'd like to use a couple of analogies. The space that I'm in right now, I mentioned that um, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a giant warehouse. I'm in an office in a giant warehouse where we build rose floats um, for, for the city that I live in. And um, one of the things that my spouse and I intentionally did was get involved in this space because hopefully I'm going to retire in about 10 years. And when I retire in about 10 years, I, need, I know that I'm going to need some structure around me to help me live a healthy life. I wanna establish relationships now, which are gonna support me in the future. Um, one of the advantages, and I, getting to see this being an outsider looking in on the Catholic church um, and, and the way my spouse grew up and her, the way her family lives is there's a lot of structure and, and ritual that is there, that is consistent, that can feel like home for people, regardless of the congregation, regardless of the parish that they go to. And that, and, and that consistency on one hand is is really nurturing. On the other hand, we know that a large number of people who are actively involved in Unitarian Universalism, including many of us, came from other religious backgrounds, other religious experiences, and there may be trauma, there may be anger, there may be a sense of rejection associated with that. And, and so sometimes we play that out in the institutions that we're in. Working on this rose float and with the people I work with, I love a lot of the people here. Some of them drive me nuts. There is plenty of dysfunction around, but I've we've intentionally created a sense of home, which makes it important. And that's what we do in our churches as well. Sometimes we forget that. And 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 I just I, I want to lift that up that is as dysfunctional as the spaces that we're in sometimes feel. We need to look out for our safety, but as dysfunctional as they are, it's really important that we understand the structure that those institutions that that Reverend Fenimore was just talking about. Um, a, another piece I just want to share real quickly about the owl thing really struck me because my spouse is actually a Catholic school teacher. And I can't tell you how many kids, how many parents have had this conversation with my spouse and she's referred over to have their kids participate in owl at the UU church because the parents know that they're not getting necessarily what they need in their spaces that they're in. And so we we offer something to the larger world we we don't we don't have to function as if we're an, an end all be all for everybody, and and it's probably not even healthy to think like that. It's not an all or nothing. It's not a zero sum game. It is um, we can take care of ourselves. We can take care of our community, and we can be open to the larger world for those that need us, that are that are hurting, that need information, that need access to care, that need a space different than the institutions that they're attached to by family or tradition or whatnot. And so sometimes it's just a matter of just breathing and it's just a matter of being still and being calm and, and allowing the spaces around us to, to, to carry the structure that they carry that we don't necessarily notice all the time. 
Um, I wanted to add something to the, I think the, at least for me, very powerful and personally resonant question of what if I'm getting more nourishment elsewhere than I'm getting in my UU congregation, or I think it was phrased as, as the UU congregation is progressing. I think that is a, such a hard and real question. And, and I've often grappled with that. And I think, you know, what I've realized is, especially as a person of color within Unitarian Universalism, no one will protect my time and energy except me and, and maybe my God and maybe my dear friends who understand that journey. Um, and so at least for me, it's been really important to pay attention to what is feeding me and let me say yes to that. And let me say yes to the things that I feel particularly called to say yes to. So I feel forever um, indebted to the folks who mentored me, particularly UU religious professionals of color and, and UU leaders of color, some of whom are on this call. And so I say yes to those people. I say yes to sitting in a pew and listening to music and doing communal singing, because those are the two things that most feed my spirit. For me right now, I don't do boards. I don't do social justice committees. I, I don't do, I bring food. I give rides, but I don't do pastoral care committees um, because that's where I'm at because a lot of the group and structure work is work that I do in my justice ministry. And so when I come to church, I'm tapped out on that. I think it's always a balance in my family for sure of like duty and obligation come very strongly in my family and honoring elders comes very strongly in my family. So it's it's not straightforward, but I, I really try to balance giving so that others may have the things I had and giving where I need to be nourished. Thank you. So um, a couple last questions. Uh, there was the one earlier um, regarding kind of oral tradition kind of approaches. And Jimmy also asks um, kind of his, the BIPOC group that he's a part of in Long Beach has talked about how young adults that grow up as you use rarely continue in the congregation, great kids rooted in values move away. And could this 100% fit idea be affecting these young adults? So those are the two questions left if any of the panelists would like to respond or share their insights. Well, I already talked a little, I can say a little bit about the oral tradition because I feel that that's a role that many um, religious educators of color have taken on. They're often asked to tell a story to be present to storytelling, to lift up storytelling as a, as a, as a spiritual practice, as a communal and learning and growing practice. So I feel that that's a role that um, religious educators are asked to take on. I think that, again, they should be supported in um, developing language so they articulate <clears throat> what they're doing and why they're doing and how they're doing it and how to increase the, the presence of uh, oral transmission um, within a uh, cultural context in the, in the congregations. Um, there, there are many uh, Eurocentric um, cultural practices that had an oral tradition that was, um, that's devalued in our congregations. And so I think we can partner around that, that understanding. Um, I was a, a member of the Commission on Institutional Change and we consciously decided that we would collect stories that there was as much value in what people were telling us and how they chose to tell them as stories, as narratives, as there was in data collection. And we chose to do both, but not to privilege one over the other. And I think that's the same thing. If you, there's a, there are different practices in which people use narrative to create even the, the strategic plan or the annual giving in your congregations. The people need to, the professional role can often be in the leadership role to articulate the why you're doing this and to lift it up as a practice that you're gonna make common in your community. So I, I would hope that, that each of you would take that on as part of your mission when you're talking to the congregations about, about that, about the need to have 
you don't have to choose one way or the other to do a thing. Right? <laughs> you can choose both as long as you don't privilege one thing over the other. Thanks, Natalie. And Rachel builds on Jimmy's question about the 100% fit idea by um, sharing. I also wonder how much of this is affected by a consumer mindset rather than a community mindset. If you view church as a transaction, it makes more sense to want 100% fit. On the other hand, being a citizen or member of a community can be messy in intention. So curious if, yeah, James? I, I'm I'm still reacting to the last question, but this one fits into it as well about feeling feeling connected and feeling a sense of of ownership and a part of. Um, this is going to sound a little crass, so please bear with me. But growing up as a UU, when we hear a lot about UU history, we hear a lot about dead white, predominantly male ministers and their writings, and um and 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 something will be something will be um read or shared, and you 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 get this like. You can feel the vibration around you of of white congregants that are that are either connecting with or or participating in the the ceremony and ritual of connecting with, and it it always kind of made me feel a little bit weird. Um, but something that Reverend Joseph has done, and if if folks haven't had a chance to 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 participate in this, I really encourage it. Um, my first um my first Jubilee World training where we did a timeline and a history we get to see where we fit on that timeline. And then the timeline that, that Reverend Joseph has put together for drum it is one of the first times where I can really see where it, it's not about me, but it's where I can see it, where I fit into the bigger picture and the bigger arc of, of, of our history. It's a history that I can claim and name. And sometimes I wonder, because I'm not a, a white male, older congregant, sometimes I wonder that connection that I'm feeling to the drum timeline, is that what other people feel like in connection to looking at history as well? And it's 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 a really it's a really powerful it, it, it's really powerful to be able to connect to that. And it's something that un, until we've seen it in spaces like drum and Jubilee World trainings, we ne haven't necessarily had the opportunity to connect to that. That might be some of the grounding that's so critically important for um for us to to identify a shared sense of history so we can actually project a shared future with each other. Thank you, James. Aisha, last word. Oh my. Um think what what I invite folks into is be for for yourselves embody the kind of Unitarian Universalism you want to see in the world. And apologies for the ableist language, but um, I one time had a supervisor call me flexible and I said, well, I am the flexibility that I wanna see in the world because I want people to be flexible with me. And so, you know, it, live the Unitarian Universalism, whether it's in your congregations or wherever you are, uh, live it loudly. I mean, I very much talk about my faith uh, in the secular world. I, I half of my job is in the secular spaces, and I tell people who I am and and what grounds me. So that that would be probably my last word. And I, because I, you know, the question about um, how to keep youth or young adults, or I, I, I'm, it's not that I don't want to do that because of course I do. And what are we asking youth and young adults to be a part of? What are we doing to show up for them? How are we eldering? How are we? So that's my last word. Thank you all. Thank you, Joseph. And thank you, Natalie and James. This was a pleasure. Friends, thank you for making the extra time to hear one another, for being here this morning, afternoon. And we wish you well on the rest of your weekend. And we'll hopefully see you again at an upcoming event. If there's anything we can do to support, please don't hesitate to reach out. And with that, we're going to bring the caucus to a close. Take care. Thanks so much, everyone.